Jack Testy one. Unregularradio.com, Boston's best online radio. What about um, Tupac's relatives, his mom, um, his half-brother, Moprim? What have they yeah. had to say about, you know, they, I know that they've said, so, at least Moprim has said some things. What, what Have they been officially yeah. on the record, off the record? What do they say about the murder? What do they think right now? Well, uh, Watani Tayahimbo was a longtime friend of uh, Fanny Shakur. He was a Los Angeles Black Panther. Um, he was Tupac's business manager, and he was a national security director of the New African People's Organization, which you know, Tupac was part of for many years. And um, so he says that uh, you know, Fanny has is, is stopped you know, getting political about all this because she's scared, rightfully scared. I mean, she's lived her life under U.S. intelligence watch, U.S. intelligence harassment, U.S. intelligence tried to arrest her. Um, I mean, they did, obviously, arrest her, and they put her in jail for years, and they tried to put her in jail for the rest of her life. Um, so, so she's keeping away from the radical political side of it all, except she did back Cynthia McKinney when Cynthia McKinney put a, put a, a bill through Congress to say, we want all of Tupac's government documents. And it was modeled after the uh, JFK um, bill to get all the JFK documents. And because uh, Cynthia McKinney knew there was an incredible amount of documents on, on uh, Tupac. And so she, she did a press conference with Cynthia McKinney to get all the government documents. Now, of course, the Justice Department told me that there's over 4,000 pages in Tupac's FBI file. They weren't supposed to tell me that, but uh, someone slipped with that. And I think it was because she liked Tupac. And um, so I paid for over 4,000 pages to be copied and sent to me, and they only sent me 99, and they said for national security reasons they weren't giving me the rest, you know, the other 3,900 <laughs> copies and pages. But um, so that's where Fanny is when she's, you know, she does some things, but she tries to stay a little away from it all. She told me, you know, that she really wants to know how much she, um, you know, is, is thankful for what I'm doing. But um, she just has to keep her a distance so she doesn't get attacked. Um, but Watani Tayahimba, of course, gave me loads of you know interviews and is very supportive. Murpreem um, Harding, he, he calls himself Murpreem Shakur now. He's Matulu's son and you know, Tupac's stepbrother. Um, he said on an interview with me just a few weeks ago that you know Tupac was a revolutionary and that's why they you know they killed him. So you know he's in agreement with the general theory of, of my book. Yeah. Yeah. There's another. Um interview on YouTube I saw too where he says he directly says he thinks it was cops and they said do you want to get more specific than that do you have any proof and he said if I did and I was speaking about it I'd be in jail <laughs> and he just left it at that I mean that is uh, yeah. it's pretty definitive you know right right from his stepbrother that's yeah um, if, if Tupac was alive today what do you think he would be what would he do you, what would he be doing likely be doing well, I think he would have his own record label because he had obviously already started his own record label, Euthanasia. So he would have been as as wealthy, but probably about five times as wealthy as um, Puffy, you know, as P. Diddy, because um, that's where P. Diddy is so incredibly wealthy because he's the producer and, and makes the majority of the money on on the uh, you know record sold, the CD sold. So he would have been you know unbelievably wealthy, and he would have been. Uh, you know, being doing some great you know, movies, I'm sure he, he was doing lots of movies. He would have written some movies because he had already written one, or you know, and um, he would have been incredibly uh, influential and powerful. And um, for someone who's such a committed uh, leftist activist to be that powerful, that you know, for the powers that be, it would have been dangerous because um, he would have committed his you know his influence his money and everything else to you know, making the society better to me for the 99 percent yeah so puff daddy has the rights to tupac stuff no, no 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 just just his own stuff he makes an incredible amount off of biggies you know cds and also other people's music yeah like and yeah puff, and other people he Puffy has is, record label. this yeah. is well known about puff daddy i'll say this is that uh he's well known to uh put people on his label um, and you know the ones that make a lot of money for his label, he still never pays. <laughs> so, oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he he's notoriously uh, a non-payer of artists for the royalties. That's, well, that's too bad. But I, I think he's I think he's to me he's relatively neutral in all this um, because there was an attack on him. There was a someone shot at him, and then um, after that shooting in New York, it, it came in. It came on uh, New York television that. The uh, New York City government paid, you know, spent the most money ever 
uh, to put someone away on gun possession. They tried so hard to put him away on gun possession. They did, too, and, yeah. And that was when he was involved with the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. That's true, um, too, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that was the time. Mm -hmm. That certainly was. That's probably scared him well, off. You know what's more, so actually. weird, too, like recently, like... Um, Anton Beatty is on uh, YouTube. A lot of people probably know him and follow him. I, I, I've watched some of his stuff. He's a very good uh, skeptic, very powerful voice influence. And he, he kind of gave you a rough time. And I know that you know we don't even need to get into it. I don't want to get into it. But basically what I want to ask, he, he kept saying that Tupac had been political earlier in his career. Mm -hmm. Went to jail and stuff, and then when he came out, he was lowest common denominator, battling with everybody, not a leader, not political. And I kind of thought maybe Anton might be right for a little while, but recently, mm -hmm. it's been obvious to me that that's just not true. And especially if you look at uh, MC, what MC Hammer has said, and some of the stuff that's even been released, where MC Hammer had a press conference with Snoop Dogg. And Tupac, where they were going to start a new political party, they were going to get active, they were going to make change. When you look at Thug Life that he put out, which was a code for street gangs to work together, when he did a summit, it seems like that's all BS, that Tupac was getting, was about to become way more pol political than he ever had. Is that, is that, am I right on that? Like, what, what do you say to that criticism? Yeah, well, Anton Beatty is, is slightly right, but which all, all that you said is, is certainly correct and true. Um, what happened was when Tupac was in prison, they used something called penal co coercion, and Amnesty International uh, cited penal coercion as the closest thing uh, the government had to brainwashing. Um, I think they, they actually have something that's closer to brainwashing, but nonetheless, the penal coercion tactics that they, they list, Am Amnesty International listed, that are being used in U.S. prisons, um, I, I showed how every single one of those tactics of penal coercion uh, was used against Tupac. And what that does is they use those penal coercion tactics against activists to mess up their minds so that they, they can't be as effective of activists. So um, Tupac Shakur, for example, was, you know, he was in solitary confinement for 10 out of his 11 months. That's 23 and a half hours a day in, with just four walls all around you in this tiny um, cell. And, and that really messes up your mind when, when you're in that. I mean, it doesn't matter how strong your mind is, how committed you are, it's going to mess your mind up. But the other tactics they use have, have been proven to mess you know, prisoners' minds up. And they use them all, I guess I say, against Tupac. And, and so I argue, I show that, this, uh, that death row records continued some of those penal coercion tactics when Tupac got out of prison. Um, to keep, you know, uh, triggering some PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder in Tupac. So I don't think he was at his best, and I think he was running scared, and he knew he had, he had told Watani Taihim, but he cried on his shoulder saying, I know I'm selling my soul to the devil by signing with death row. Um, because Watani had to disconnect himself and his whole New African People's Organization from Tupac at that point out of fear for what death row really was and fear of, of all this stuff going on in death row, all this drug trafficking and other illegal stuff going on in there from taking his organization down with it. So, um, so Death Row did cause Tupac to write his most negative lyrics, uh, you know, for that next album, All Eyes on Me. I'm sorry, not All Eyes on Me. I mean, um, yeah, I'm all sorry, All Eyes, eyes on, on Me. me. Yeah, that's the first and then finally the, the last album, Tupac started getting back to his political lyrics, like, of course, you know, White Man's World is obviously a very political song. Um, against all odds, says uh, you know Haitian Jack and you know James and Hench Jimmy Henchman knew you were working for the feds, meaning the Federal Bureau of Investigation, when you set me up and wet me up, meaning she had me shot. So then, he, obviously, his last album got political again. But um, he was running a little scared. He wasn't acting himself, you know, for the 11 months when he was out of jail until he was killed. But at the same time, behind the scenes, he was trying to do things again. He was meeting with Sanyika Shakur, you know, Monster Cody Scott, the uh, you know acclaimed author of the book Monster, uh, the memoir about going from you know gang leader to um, to socialist. So um, he was doing the things you just said, you know, with um, Snoop Dogg, you know, speaking at events. I got a picture of him speaking speaking at an activist event with Snoop Dogg right behind him. And of course, with you know, um, you know, uh, you know, meeting with other activists. So uh, you know, so you know, Anton Beatty is slightly right, but everything you said is more right. And what I'm talking about with uh, the other work is is very important because he was he was uh, getting 
you know, the Bloods and Crips to call peace truces and start turning on to activism all around California, and it was spreading nationwide. And that was a huge threat to U.S. intelligence.